How are you all today? I am happy to hear you all doing great. I can say I'm doing the same myself. It's very, very nice to hear you all are here. Thank you so much for this. This means so much to me. So I have a confession to make. I just lied to all of you. I'm not doing great. I'm not doing okay. I'm not doing good. But I have to tell myself that I'm doing great. I have to tell myself I'm doing good. And every day I have to tell myself I'm doing okay. Because Ariana, remember the risk that your father took for you to be on this stage today. Ari, remember your mom wanted to experience this, but she couldn't. Remember your grandparents who are not physically here today they're missing this, but they dreamt of this. And then there's my ancestors. Knowledge is power. And this country knew that, which is why they made sure they didn't get that. And so I have to do great because of all of this. But I'm crashing. Truthfully, I crashed this semester, my fall semester of senior year. Now, I thought senior year was supposed to be very fun, very exciting. I was ready, but I didn't know what was to come. Very few of my friends knew what was really going on with me. My smile, my laugh, my bubbliness. I made sure that was always present so no one could really see this girl screaming. And so I took myself out of the situation because when things become a little too overwhelming, I don't want to deal with it. That's the Capricorn in me. And so I went to this childhood tactic that I created when I was a little girl. And I would go into someone else's story, factional or fictional, it didn't matter. And what that meant was I left everything that I was feeling and right now I'm crashing and I don't want to crash. So I went into a friend's story. I went into a book story and I put myself in their situation. So I'm helping them, I'm giving them advice, I'm telling them to keep going, but I can't even tell myself that. When I got to college, I noticed that this was bigger than me getting lost in someone else's world. What I really was doing was abandoning my own story. It gave me an outlet. Now, you all may be wondering, why is she abandoning her own story? This is the part where I share pieces of my story to better make sense of what is at stake if I do not do great? What is at stake if I let everyone down? And what does that mean for me? When I was a little girl, my family unofficially slash officially coined me as the change maker. They were like, that's the one. And I look back at them, I'm like, who's the one? I was like, not me. And the reason I asked that and the reason I said that was because my family is huge on both sides. And so I would point to everyone else and be like, no, you could be the one. No, you could be the one. You could be the one too. But every single person I pointed at was pointing right back at me. And they were all saying, no, you're the one. I said, okay. Let's see what it's go. Let me do it. Let me see what the one is. And so you can assume the pressure that I had. My family placed me so high on a pedestal that I could not see ground. I was in the clouds by myself. And I'm looking around. I see no one. And I try to bring those in my family up with me but they're so scared to come up. And I'm like, why? 
I will find out later. And this caused me to rewind even further into my family. And so my mind rewinds to the past. And it stopped on my dad. My mother had me when she was 16 years old. My father had me when he was 15 years old. Babies, having a baby. Imagine you are a 15-year-old black boy in the south suburbs of Chicago, not too far from the south side itself. And your significant other just announced you all are about to have a baby girl. And you are like, okay, I know what this means. I need a job. And so you apply, and you apply, and you apply. And minimum wage is not what's up. And so you're like, all right, you're getting frustrated. And you keep hearing the word no. No, I'm sorry, this job is not available anymore. No, I'm sorry, it's been filled. And those that do say yes, it would never be enough to support a baby. And another year later, you're expecting another one. What would you do? My father knew what was at stake if he did not do something very quickly for his two kids. And so, he went into the drug dealing business. And before I go more into that, I want to talk about this notion of what we think of when we think of a drug dealer today. Media is very powerful. The entertainment outlets are extremely powerful. It can change the way you see things about people without you even knowing until you see them in your face. And so I understand there are individuals who go out into the drug dealing business because they want to make a quick dollar. They think it'll give them something. They feel as if they need that to prove something. And I'm not saying that's not the case with some, because it is. And I've seen many people do it just for that reason or those reasons alone. What I'm saying right now is that my dad didn't do it for those reasons. My dad did it because by the age of 20, he had two toddlers, two very interesting toddlers. And he knew that in order to provide for him and his, he needed something. He needed enough. And the situation around him was not enough. Because of his gender, because of his location, and because of his sex, he knew he would not get what he needed. And so I'm thinking of this in the back of my head while I'm crashing right now in my senior year. And I'm thinking of this pedestal my family placed on me. And I'm like, all right. So I have to do great because of what they believed in me and what my father did for me. And I realized I'm trying to give them a second chance with my first chance. Did I think I could do it? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. They placed me really, really high. I was like, nah, this ain't it. And I will tell you why I thought that. On this one hand, I have all of this going inside of my head of what my father did, of how my mother never got to experience college because she had to take care of two kids how my grandparents wish for this, but it just wasn't in their cards. And they're not here today because they passed away earlier, and so they would never see me do this. And then I'm thinking of my ancestors and how much this would mean. But I mean, I will never meet them, right? And then on this other hand, I'm thinking of something else. When you see me right now, on this stage, what do you see? 
I asked myself that question. So I stepped out of my physical being and looked at myself in the mirror. And I'm like, what do I see? And what I saw was a black and Puerto Rican young woman. In that description alone, I just labeled three strikes against the traditional American dream advancement. History has read a narrative about me since I was born, and I've been working so hard to rewrite that narrative. And just having that in my head and what my physical being represented in this country and all of the other things I've just mentioned, I created this perfect accident, and I crashed. And I crashed hard. When we think of accidents involving crashes, there are two outcomes that usually come into play, one over-discussed as opposed to the other. The first outcome is that the person didn't make it. It just didn't end well. Or that individual did make it, but the trauma that sat with them from that accident ate them alive. And they just couldn't take it anymore. And either they took themselves out of it, or they just sat in it. And it dictated them for the rest of their lives and what they were out to do. And for the first few months of my senior year, I was in this section. I was in the one where I let the trauma just eat me, and I let the pressure just consume me. And I just sat in my bed all the time. It was very hard for me to get out of bed. But then you have this outcome. And this outcome is the miracle outcome, the one that's not talked about a lot because for some reason, we like the bad more than the good. But I like the good. And this outcome represents those who have been in the accident, those who have crashed, and those who have picked themselves back up from it. And that can look many, many different ways. But for me, what that meant was I had to do something to get myself out of this downward spiral that I was in. I'm like, OK, this is senior year. We cannot keep going down like this. This ain't cute. And so three things is what saved me this semester. And the first is I had to believe in myself that I am enough. Many, many, many times I did not think that. And my reasoning was because there's just so many unknowns being a first-gen college student from where I come from. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what to do. And I didn't think I was enough for this. Because if I was, then I thought someone else in my family would have done this before me. So I'm like, all right. But now I know. I am more than enough for this. And I always will be more than enough for this. The second, I am worthy. I mentioned earlier that history wrote a narrative about me and what my physical being represents in this country. And just me going on my social media and me seeing what I saw every day and how if I was to go home right now and turn on the news, and it will say, a young boy, a young girl, a grandmother, an uncle has just been killed and shot in Chicago. That affects you. You start to think, are you worthy enough? Is my body worthy enough? Will it get the respect that it deserves and that I know it deserves? But I was like, let me push all that out my head. I, I understand what the news is saying, but I would never be that one that they're talking about. I'm worthy enough for this. And then the third one, I'm capable enough for this. 
And when I keep saying for this, I am talking about getting this college degree in 203 days, and yes, I am counting. <laughs> I'm capable enough to do this. What well, my family believed in me when I was super young, just reading books in the corner by herself, they was like, okay, she's a little different. And I'm like, you right. So I'm capable enough to do this. I always was. It just took a very long time to really make myself believe that. And this is for anyone who feel as if they're going in a downward spiral and they're confused at first. And they're like, what's going on? And it seems to not make sense, especially in the moment that you're in. You just feel like it's messing up everything else. You're not alone. You were never alone. And while, yes, it may be easy to get lost in someone else's story, like I used to do, because you don't want to deal with the unpleasant climaxes of your own, remember, your story was written for you by you. And you are the author that can dictate the ending. So I just got one last question. How do you want yours to end? Thank you.